I am so honored today to introduce Dr. Temple Grandin. Really great to be here today. Lots of things to talk about today. And right up here on my first slide, I've got my book, Outdoor Scientist. It's all the things my sister and I did when we were kids outside. Rock collections, looking at stars, observing animals. We gotta get kids off the video games and out doing things. Um, because what I'm seeing with the video games, with the fully verbal autistic kids, is there's kind of two paths in life to the bedroom to play video games or get out and have a life. Not seeing much in the middle. It's kind of one or the other. And I'd like to just tell it like it is. I spent 25 years in heavy construction and boy, we need, we need some of the kids from the special ed department to build things right now. We'll be talking more about that later. I'm also a big believer in going across disciplines. So yesterday I was in Playforce factory. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. Today I'm here. There's relationships here. It's important to go across disciplines. Now the thing I wanna ask you is what would happen to some of our top innovators today if they were in today's educational system? Because one of the problems we've got with autism is at one end of the spectrum, we've got Elon Musk. How many people here know that Elon Musk is autistic? You know, the SpaceX guy? I've always thought he was autistic when I read Ashley Vance's book several years ago. I had that book all marked up, but I couldn't say it. Now I can say it. <laughs> so you got Elon Musk at one end, and you got somebody who's got epilepsy, nonverbal, other kinds of really bad medical problems on top of autism at the other end. All has the same name. And a lot of people get too much locked into the label. Now, for some reason, we didn't get navigating autism here today, but Amazon's got plenty of copies. And Deborah Moore, she did most of the work on that book, she has a wonderful saying, label locking, which simply means that you can't see the kid beyond the label. You can't not seeing the kid past the label. Well, we're going to be talking about different kinds of thinking. I think you verbal thinkers have problems with getting label locked. Because what I'm seeing today is we're doing a good job of the young kids, but where we're falling down is the transition to adulthood. I'm seeing too many parents overprotective. Kids are not learning shopping. They aren't learning basic skills, the most basic stuff that I was doing when I was seven and eight years old. Now, I have a lot of grandparents come up to me, and they discover that they're on the autism spectrum when the kids get diagnosed. Um, and they usually had good jobs. That's because they learned working skills young. They had a paper route when they were really young. We gotta start teaching working skills young. It's a different kind of ability than just doing academic work. Now, where a diagnosis helps adults is with their relationships. A lot of adults on the spectrum that are fully verbal, they go, oh, now I know why my marriage is a mess. That's where the diagnosis is helpful. But on the fully verbal end of the spectrum, I'm seeing too many kids held back by a special ed diagnosis. ADHD, autism, dyslexia, there's a lot of crossover, especially with ADHD and autism. There's about 30% genetic crossover, and then also just the symptoms. Now, let's look at some of the people that made going to the moon possible. It's the greatest thing that my generation did. I'm a total NASA geek, so we're gonna geek out on my trip to Cape Kennedy. I went there four years ago. Uh, I got really emotional uh, standing in front of the vehicle assembly building. I got to go inside it. I wasn't supposed to go on the roof, but I did. Uh, that was really, really cool. Then I visited this launch pad, and this launch pad's now finished. Maybe the right stuff went to the moon, but the special ed department built the stuff. And I'm serious. The head of this project had Tourette syndrome. I am serious here. This is kind of the paradox between what's going on in your world as educators and parents and the world out there of building and making things. All right, this is one of my most important slides. On the fully verbal end of the spectrum, or kids that have other labels, oppositional defiant, that's a fancy word for bad boy, uh, especially if they don't have a shop teacher to turn them around, 
And then you've got dyslexic, ADHD, sensory processing disorder. You've got more disorders than you've got brain systems. See, the problem you've got with an autism diagnosis, and a lot of these diagnoses, they're not precise. You can go do a very specific genetic test and say, you have COVID Delta variant, or you have COVID some other variant. That is a precise test. Now, I'm what's called an object visualizer. Everything I think about is a picture. And the HBO movie, Temple Grandin, shows exactly how I think. But you know what? I don't think I could graduate from high school today. How did I get out of taking algebra? I cannot do algebra. There's brilliant visual thinkers out there building food processing factories that can't do algebra, saved by a single welding class. Now, I want to make it very clear, that's not for everybody, but you don't know unless you try things. I managed to get out of algebra because it wasn't the required class when I took freshman math in 67. I had to be tutored and tutored and tutored in statistics. I got a C as in Charlie, barely wobbled through that. That was a gift C. But you need the people that can't do algebra. I think in some states you can learn English, algebra, and sports in this school, and that's about it. But object visualizers are good at things like graphic design. I'm very interested that Playcore hires industrial designers to design their, their play equipment. That's the art side of engineering, when they're very good at it. Then you have your visual spatial. This is your mathematician. These are the people that do all the computer stuff out in Silicon Valley. I've been out to the big tech companies. Yeah, half those programmers are on the spectrum. So one kid gets to go work for Google, another kid's playing video games in the basement. They're the same kid. Then you got the verbal guy who loves facts, loves history, the verbal kind of autistic person. You see, an autistic person, if they were a computer, would be an Intel 286. So if you're a computer geek, geek look up what an Intel 286 is. Small processor, huge memory. And then so-called normal people, they're mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. And I'm going to be talking later on how the different kinds of thinking can do projects together. And then you've got some dyslexic kids, they're auditory thinkers. They're going to learn best through their ears. I've been noticing an interesting thing happening with book publishing. Everybody thought the e-books would take over. They have not. I was very surprised when I got the royalty check for thinking in pictures this year that one third of the books were audiobook. Really, really surprised at that. Okay, let's look at some mission critical people here who are going to the moon. Katherine Johnson, she's the black lady, very much discriminated against, but without her math, the first mercury capsules could have burned up coming into the atmosphere. But one good thing was done with Katherine Johnson. Her ability in math was enhanced. She was moved right up to high school and college math when she was in elementary school. That was done right. Building up on areas of strength. Now there's another guy who was an algebra guy, not my kind of mind, lived in a messy office, did algebra for play, admitted that everybody else did all the work, but without his equations, the lunar lander could have crashed. Mission critical. And these are people that have just got, gotten recognized relatively recently. Yeah, without these people, the missions could have failed. And we've got to thank the Playtex Corporation for making this moon spacesuit. I am not kidding. Sewn by the finest brass seamstresses in the industry. Mission critical. Let's give them credit. You see, and this is all kind of skilled trades kind of stuff. Now, these are the cameras that are in the Mars rover that's up on Mars right now, taking those beautiful pictures. And you can see that these cameras aren't very large. I mean, look at the pocket knife that's next to the cameras. They're small. Somebody made those on a workbench. Look at the hand done wiring. That's all done by hand. Somebody made those. The mathematicians got it to Mars, but some craft skilled tradesperson put those cameras together. And if that hadn't been done right, you wouldn't have the beautiful pictures. This is where you've got to have the whole team. And there's one of the pictures from Mars, really cool. Now, if you get a new Tesla, oh yeah, let me tell you, Elon Musk has fun. This, it's, a, it's a car designed by a little boy, and there's a GPS app with Mars maps, with Mars pictures. There's another app on there that's really Elon's inner 10-year-old, 
And if you come up to me later on, I'll tell you what that app is. You know, so looking at the emotions here, um, a brain can either be more thinking or a brain can be more social emotional. I get really emotional about really cool stuff, you know, that people can do. My grandfather was a co-inventor of the autopilot for airplanes. He was an MIT trained mathematical engineer. He worked with another guy who came up with this goofy idea for three little coils. Everybody in aviation thought this was just stupid. And they spent years in a loft over where they fixed trains, tinkering with this thing. They finally got it to work. They were bad business people. It got ripped off. And the ripoff was in every plane during World War II. And uh, they didn't sue because we needed it for the war effort for World War II. But that was two people working together, a mathematical engineer and a guy that probably was on the autism spectrum that came up with this weird idea. Michelangelo dropped out of school at age 12. Filthy, dirty slob. Yeah, this is one of the things where some people on the spectrum, they got to clean up their hygiene. That's non-negotiable. There's some stuff you're going to have to do. But what helped Michelangelo to be successful? He was living in a town where every church had commissioned art. So he was seeing art. He also grew up learning how to use stone cutting tools. This brings up another really important thing. Kids have to be exposed to things or they can't possibly go into it. Then he had some really good mentors later on, but that was later on after he started making sculpture. Steve Jobs is probably on the spectrum, bullied in school. <coughs> I got bullied a lot in school. And the only place I was not bullied was friends through shared interests. Horseback riding, model rockets, and electronics. Those were the places where I had friends through shared interests. Can't emphasize that enough. Einstein would land in an autism class today, no speech delay three. I can argue over whether or not he's autistic, but he definitely had speech delay. So where do you think he'd be with speech delay? Thomas Edison was probably on the spectrum. He was labeled a hyperactive adult high school dropout. Learned to work at a very young age. Had a mentor that taught him how to operate the telegraph. So this was learning work skills really young. He's a naughty boy. While he was selling papers, he was doing chemistry experiments in the baggage car of a train and burnt up the baggage car of a train. Imagine how much trouble he would have gotten in, into today for doing that. Now we need to be keeping these classes in the schools. I think one of the worst things that schools have done is taking out all the hands-on classes. Art, sewing, cooking, playing musical instruments, woodworking, theater, welding, auto shop, creative writing. These are all things that can lead to really good careers that expose kids to different things so they can get interested. Get a lot of factories around here and uh, they're hiring right now. And uh, they also need people from the special ed department to design equipment for them too. Now, how do you figure out what kind of a thinker a kid is? I get asked that all the time. First of all, you don't usually see it in two-year-olds or three-year-olds. This is gonna show up a little later on when they're around second grade, maybe third grade. Visual thinkers like me love to build things and we're good at art. And my mother always encouraged my ability in art. This is really important. Math thinkers, they like to build things. They love patterns. They think in patterns. They often like music. Let's introduce computer programming really young. There's a thing called scratch programming. I think cat scratch. It's called scratch programming for really little kids. There's a thing called Spiro. It's a little ball you can program. It's for little kids programming. Well, you have to introduce programming. How's a kid going to find out he likes programming if he doesn't try it? I tried it. I couldn't do it. But it's important to, ex to expose kids to everything. Verbal thinkers love history. They love facts. This is the kid that often just loves history. Now, when he grows up or she grows up, she might be really good at specialized retail. There's been some big successes with the verbal type minds selling cars, selling office equipment, selling uh, business insurance, things where there's appreciated for specialized knowledge. Now, let's look at careers. Visual thinkers, me, graphic design, 
designing web pages, mechanics, skilled trades, and we need a lot of people in high-end skilled trades. Right now in Colorado, there's 75 or 80 positions open for electricians' apprentices. They'll hire them right off the street. When we were building our new chemistry building about five years ago, they were frantic for electricians. You know, wiring's not going away. You know, people said, well, everything's digital. Well, you know, when you order something from Amazon, there's a huge physical infrastructure. It doesn't just come out of a computer. And I'm getting worried today that we've got, you know, we've got people that are gonna grow up and become policymakers that have absolutely no idea how the stuff they'll make policy about will work, like problems with container ships and supply chain. I had a student that didn't know what a container ship was. I had another student just last spring who had never used a ruler to measure anything. Yeah, you need to work with real things. Math thinkers, they're gonna be the programmers. They're gonna be the people running Silicon Valley. And we talked about the verbal thinker maybe doing specialized retail. A Nobel Prize winner was 50% more likely to have an arts and crafts hobby compared to other scientists. That's another reason for keeping these classes. Now, when you're weird, let's talk about how to get jobs. There's a gigantic back door. Half of all jobs are back door. Not the interview process. Not all this online nonsense. You gotta short circuit that. Here's the example. My mind thinks in specific examples. I don't think in generalities. Verbal thinkers are top then, a lot of generalities. Here's a specific example. Just this year, an autistic person got a great job working for a national food safety lab company and he receives the samples that come in from different co food companies. Very responsible job. You have to make sure you do not mix up the samples and you do not cross-contaminate them. It was just gotten through uh, you know, uh, networking in the town. We've got to look into those networks. I was at the Rotary meeting yesterday and there was a man there that said his son couldn't get an interview. And I said, this is the Rotary meeting. You're in the back door right now and you don't even realize it. People don't see that. So when you're weird, what I learned I had to do is not sell my personality, but to show off my work. Sell your skill. So I would show people my drawings. And when people saw my drawings, they were impressed. Sell the work. This is a drawing right here that in the late 80s, I sent to Cargill. I designed the front end of every Cargill plant in North America for Bave. Pretty good for somebody they thought was retarded. And this drawing was sent to Mr. Fielding. And you might wonder why is it curved, because cattle always want to go back to where they came from. That's why it's curved. And why did I put on there, you need to touch to perceive? I watched the industry go from hand drafting to computerized drafting. This was mid-90s. We started getting weird mistakes on drawings, like the center of the circle wasn't in the center of the circle. Also getting drawings that are too schematic. I got a set of drawings from a major engineering firm two years ago. This was a steel and concrete cattle stockyard, and they didn't draw in the reinforcement rod. I go, really? You know, you can't just write that in the specs. You've got to draw it on the drawing and show how to place the rod. Like, you've got to be kidding. So I penciled in the reinforcement rod, and I said, well, take this back to that engineering firm and make them draw this in correctly. That's now. When you're as old as I am, I've got to specify something, old information versus new information. That's one of the pictures that got sent to Mr. Fielding. So I sent him drawings, I sent him pictures. What you basically want to do is that 30 second wow. Don't put too much junk in it. And you got to put the right stuff in it for the right customer. Now I love the fact the HBO movie cre recreated all my jobs, love that. The HBO movie also showed exactly how I think visually. That was accurate. Because a lot of people that are verbal don't understand visual thinking. I thought everybody was a visual thinker until I got into my late 30s. Well, the first step you have to do on the different kinds of thinking is realize they exist. And now we can talk about how we can put the different kinds of thinkers together into teams. There's my brochure, real professional. Today, you're gonna put this stuff on your phone. Today, it'll be colored pictures. <coughs> Back when I did this, Colored photography was too expensive. 
That was one of the pictures right there, a job I did in 1983, steel and concrete work, cattle ramp at a meat plant. That got sent to Mr. Fielding. And there's the original black and white picture of the original project I did in 1976. Now the thing I want to ask you right now, who builds large food processing plants? I've worked for every single company, big meat company. So what I'm going to do now is I want to get you to understand another world out there in industry. You live in the heart of industry here. I was in Play Course Factory yesterday. And there's a lot of similarities between Play Course Factory and the factories I worked with. Uh, you know, meat plants tend to be wet. Their factory's not wet. But, but so many things were the same. Now, who builds these great big factories? The visual thinkers do what I call the clever engineering department. All of the very clever equipment, think packaging equipment. A person with a drafting technician title lays out the whole entire factory. And the mathematical thinkers, your degreed engineers, they'll do the boilers and the refrigeration, the stuff that's more mathematical. You gotta have the whole team or you don't get the factory. And what's happening is the visual thinkers are retiring. And what's happening is, is a lot of equipment we're not making anymore. You want a poultry processing plant? It's gonna come from Holland. You want a laser cutter? to make all those cute little designs in metal that's on play course play equipment. The machine is from Career. Now, the price of shipping containers is going up, so the big metal panels that shield it, those will be made here. But the heart of the machine is probably one shipping container. That's going to come from Career. Now, as I talk about this, I see it. Nothing's abstract in the supply chain. Also, I find supply chain stuff super interesting. Now, here's an important thing. When I was out working on these big construction projects, 70s, 80s, 90s, 20% of the people I worked with that designed steel welded equipment were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. I am saying this seriously. I talked to a boy last night that's very, very um, well, fed up with school. He'd like to take welding. And the problem is it's too late at the community college. We have to be exposing kids a lot earlier. But I know somebody who's dyslexic, ADHD, rotten student, took a welding class, owns a big metal fabrication company, owns. I have to be vague about what they make because um, they're not officially diagnosed. Multiple patents, two different companies I worked with. Designing and building complicated equipment. There would be special ed kids today. Where are, those, where are the kids now that should be making these factories? They're playing video games in the basement. There's a relationship between a very fancy machine I saw in play for a shop and what goes on here. And the reason why it comes from career is because the kid that should make it is playing video games in the basement. There's a relationship. And they've made these games more and more and more addictive. And you know what you can sometimes wean them off these games? Auto mechanics. You see, my mind thinks in specific examples. My kind of mind would, are the video game addicts. There's been three cases of successful weaning off of t adults in their 20s, fully verbal adults, by slowly introducing car mechanics. And one of the guys is working for the railroad now, fixing trains, and they love it. All right, you see that equipment there? Everything's imported. State-of-the-art pork processing plant. That was built in 2019. That picture was taken in 2019. The equipment's from Quebec, Canada, and Holland. Then I went to another one this spring. The equipment's from Italy, Germany, and Holland, Denmark. That's because they've kept their, their skilled trades. I'm talking real high-end skilled trades. I'm not talking roofing here. Yep, I noticed as I flew into Atlanta, everybody's got a white roof now. You know, that's uh, semi-skilled trades. I went out to the Steve Jobs Theater. This is 2019. See the wall, glass walls holding up the building? The glass walls on the mothership? You can look that stuff up on the, online. They're from Italy and Germany. And then this carbon fiber roof right here is from Dubai. Yeah, 
We are losing skills. And you've got carpet plants here, and I'm sure if I went into those carpet plants, I'm gonna get more and more upset as I look at where the equipment comes from. Okay, you go into Play Course Factory, I go in their machine shop, the old stuff's all US, the old machine tools. The new stuff is foreign. Yeah, there's a relationship here between a special ed department and what's going on in these factories. This is something where I'm a big believer of going across disciplines. All right. Uh, Perseverance took selfies of herself as she landed on Mars. This is the parachute that landed on Mars. The fabric was made in the United Kingdom, sewn on high, it was uh, woven, high-tech European looms. They made the parachute here, but the fabric is from Europe. Real, real high-tech fabric. Now the thing is, visual thinkers like me, and a lot of autistic people, computers, People with autism were bottom-up thinkers. This is a really important concept. And there's still a few copies of my book, The Autistic Brain, left. And a verbal thinker makes a big theory, okay, inclusiveness or something like that. Well, then how do we implement it? Well, I don't know. You see, this is where my kind of mind takes specific examples of things that might be successful, things, uh, uh, cases that might have been failures, and looks at putting them together into categories, sort of like on a spreadsheet. Okay, jobs that would be really bad, for example, a lot of multitasking. Failed the jobs. McDonald's takeout window, super crazy busy store at Christmas time. Jobs that were successful. Selling office equipment. Uh, selling cars. Uh, uh, welding and starting a metal fabrication shop. Those were things that were successful. There are also things that don't have multitasking. I cannot multitask. Top-down thinkers overgeneralize. Also, as a visual thinker, it's sensory-based thinking. So if you're working with adults that remain nonverbal, they live in a world that's sensory disordered. As I've got a few books out there written by people who are nonverbal, certified to type completely independently without being touched. And the only way you can be sure who offered something is that when they write it, you're not touching the person or the thing that they type on, whatever it is. Can't touch either one of those things. All right, kids that are different. Working memory, I don't have any working memory. But what I've got is lots and lots of long-term memory. This is why the multitasking is such a problem. I cannot remember long strings of verbal information. So a problem that happens on a lot of entry-level jobs is the manager of the McDonald's gets mad and says, well, I already showed this kid three times how to take the ice cream machine apart. Is he stupid? Well, that's because you explain it to him verbally. Give him a pilot's checklist. Step one, step two, step three for tear down. Cleaning steps, one, two, three, four. Reassembly steps. Just like a pilot's checklist. You can look those up online. The big problem I'm seeing now on the fully verbal end of the spectrum with teenagers is parents that overprotect them. They're not learning basic skills like shopping. And mother always gave me choices, but they were limited choices. When I was 15, I had a chance to go out to my aunt's ranch. I could stay for a week or I could stay all summer. Limited choices. Give the kid a feeling of control. We've got to limit the video game playing, period. One hour a day, period. Now there's some individuals that um, are um, like making friends through games where they talk to each other. I don't want to totally cut that off. But I've got to limit the video game playing because I'm seeing two paths, the bedroom or the basement, or get out and have a life. That is what I'm seeing. I don't see much of a middle path. Sort of goes one way or the other. And I'm seeing the most babied stuff on shopping. And I've gotten kids to shop. I'll give you a specific example because my mind works in specific examples. So here's a specific example of a success. A mom and her 12-year-old daughter come up to me in the gate room at one of the airports. I don't remember which one it was. I know it was not Denver. And I got to talking to this girl, and I found out she'd never shopped. So I pulled $5 out of my wallet, and I said, go to that newsstand across the hall and buy something. She did that. We just went, had her go across the hall. We could see it. It was right across the hall. She bought a drink and brought me back to change. First time she shopped. Mom was kind of shocked. You see, that's how you do it. Something real close by like that. What's the ultimate goal of education? 
Where's a student 10 years after graduation? I hope he's not in the basement playing video games, that's for sure, or in jail or drug addicted or some other bad thing, but getting out and having a life. One thing that helps me is getting lots of exercise, a burst of hard exercise every day. Hundreds of sit-ups every day, I hate them, but I find I can't sleep if I don't do that burst of exercise. All right, here's my work experience. We gotta start with chores for little kids. When I was 13, mother got me a little sewing job, just in the neighborhood. There was a lady that um, did, home, uh, did dressmaking out of her home, and I took apart dresses and I hemmed them. Well, we need to be taking 10-year-olds and have, doing church volunteer jobs, where they learn how to do a task on a schedule outside the home. Really important skill to learn, and he started 10 or 11 years old. That's the substitute for the old paper routes. When I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls, nine stalls every day, putting them in and out, feeding them. And then I had a little sign painting business. You see, this is the entrepreneur. You know, Elon Musk was making video games and selling them, not playing them. But he's just old enough to have avoided the most addictive games. I mean, I looked up the things he would have played, and he's filled his car up with his childhood games. Oh yeah, you got the Mars app, Mars GPS, you got Rainbow Road, all kinds of fun apps, and then you got one that's really 10-year-old child. We'll let you find that one, it's under emissions. You look it up. Uh, so when I was in college, every summer, I had a career-relevant internship. You see, you wanna have a gradual transition from the world of school to the world of work. And I'd like to have the transition to work complete by the time they graduate from high school. That's two real jobs before they graduate. And you gotta look at your back doors. There's all these back doors. There's a scene in the HBO movie where I go up to the editor and I get the editor's card. Because I knew if I wrote for that magazine, that would help my career. I saw that back door. People are not seeing the back door, it's right there. It's right there. You don't have to go front door. Forget the interviews, forget the online garbage. Use the back door, it's there. Okay. Back doors, half of all good jobs for everybody are back door. Networking, okay, LinkedIn, put up a LinkedIn page where their person's work on it. Contacts in the industry, the back doors are there. You're just not seeing them. Now, in, in my neighborhood, here are some things that were done to teach social skills to all kids. And this is one of the reasons why granddaddy got a job, and maybe junior stuff. When we were about seven or eight, we had to dress up in our good cl clothes when the family had a party and greet the guests. Learn how to greet the guests. Also, they used a method I call teachable moments. So you're sitting at the dining room table and I stick my finger in my drink to stir it. Mother didn't scream no, she'd say, use the spoon. You give the instruction. Also, grown-ups in my generation corrected little kids. It didn't matter where they were. Like if I touched too much stuff in the store, the clerks would go, only touch what you're gonna buy. They would give the instruction. Also, I got an allowance when I was a little kid. 50 cents a week, you'd buy a lot. I could get five Superman comics. But if I wanted a 69 cent airplane, I had to save for two weeks. I was learning that at eight years old. Now it's gonna be $5 at the dollar store. But the same idea. And there were certain little trinkets that we got that mother considered allowance items. She never bought candy, she never bought comics or little toy airplanes. And then if my sister and I wanted to play games at the county fair, we saved for an entire month to play these games. And I'm realizing now the important skills that that taught, that's not a hard thing to do. And I'm seeing a lot of parents having problems with letting go. When I talk about getting their kid a job, I'm hearing this over and over again. We're thinking about it. I don't want to think about it. I want to do it. I spent 25 years in heavy commercial construction. And it's all about sell the job, design the job, supervise the construction, start it up, make it work. It's all about outcomes. I don't want this kid ending up in the basement. Well, friends who shared interests. That's me as a teenager doing things I really like to do. Also, when I was a teenager, I took this ugly shed and I made it look nice. No, I couldn't decorate it with flying saucers. 
I had to decorate it with something that other people would want. Really important work skill. And when I was in my 20s, I was painting signs for the carnival. Well, now all the signs are computer made. So how did I get this job? I showed a portfolio of some of my sign painting to a sign painter at the carnival. But I'm realizing the important things that I learned. This is the world's dumbest uh, exhibit right here. It was a wax dummy in a freezer full of ice is what it was. And there's my sign painting truck. Let's talk about driving. My aunt's mailbox was three miles away on a dirt road. So every day I drove to the mailbox. You gotta do a lot of practice in a really safe place. This solves the multitasking. You gotta get the driving into motor memory before you do traffic. Lots of driving in big parking lots in completely safe place. It's gonna take longer. Driver's head often forces them into it way too quickly. Way, way too quickly. Mo lots and lots of practice. Slow transition to the world of work. Jobs on a schedule outside the home. Uh, and learning to work before you graduate from high school. But I'm seeing so many parents have so much trouble with letting go. I suggested to one mom, again, I think in specific examples, a 16 year old, and I suggested that he go into the office supply store and buy printer paper. Printer paper. Mom burst into tears. And I said, I know I'm not being very nice, but you're gonna thank me. Printer paper. Think about it. You're crying because I suggested that your kid buy printer paper. Yeah, I'm visualizing that. Really? What's dangerous about printer paper? And the store was next door to the supermarket. See, when I talk about this, I see it. I've said to mom, the next time you buy gas, pick out the gas station and the pump where you can see into the store, give your kids some money and have them go in the store and buy a jug of milk. Just do it casually. You'll be amazed. You see, I see how to do that. Another important, I had a lot of mentors. Let's talk about where good teachers helped me. My speech teacher. Two teachers working in the basement of a little house. It was a speech therapy school. My mother, always stretching me just outside the comfort zone, but giving me um, choices. Now, yesterday we were over at Playcore, and they've got a new piece of equipment that's modeled after a, a contraption that our school built when I was a child, kind of a trolley thing. It was made with a barn door track. A lot of people around. This kid's about 11 years old, full, you know, verbal, and getting all stressed out, and, and he said, want to go home. And I said to the mom, walk down to the other end of the field. They kind of have this skunk works there where they have stuff they've tried. I said, just walk away from all the noise here and the commotion. And now his kid climbed up on this rock thing they had over on the other side of the field, and another kid was up there with him, and he was fine. All he needed was a little break away from the other, other noise, and there was a whole bunch of other kids and grown-ups around. And now as I'm talking about that, I'm seeing it. No, he didn't need to take him home. He just needed to have a break from the noise. I had a great third grade teacher. I had a great science teacher who got me motivated to study. And then in the work world, there was Jim the contractor, a former Marine Corps captain. And uh, he saw my drawings and he seeked me out. He was starting a tiny construction company. We did jobs together for 10 years. You see, mentors get attracted to ability. All right, mother taught me to read when I was eight. I didn't know how to read. Mother homeschooled me with phonics. So some kids are gonna be a phonics learner, some kids are gonna be a whole word learner. Use the method that works. Okay, sensory problems. The thing about sensory issues, they're really real. They're also highly variable. I have problems with sound sensitivity, problems with touch sensitivity. I can't stand scratchy things against my skin. Uh, some kids have uh, um, visual sensitivity, which I do not have. They're very variable, they're very real. And if you have a child that, um, I, you know, you might use headphones to block out the sound, but the problem is, if you wear the headphones all the time, the brain gets more sensitive. But what you wanna do is give the kid control. Have them in your backpack, but try not to wear them. Or if the kid hates the vacuum cleaner, let the child turn that on and off where they control it. Here's some successes. Vacuum cleaner went from feared thing to most fun thing to play with when the kid could control it. 
Okay, buzzer on the scoreboard, one of these things right here. Never know when it's gonna go off. Kids terrified of it. Take them down to the gym when nobody's there and they let them play with the button. And this kid started tapping out tunes on it. Another kid terrified of sirens. Took them down to the fire station and let them set it off where they control it. That can sometimes help on sound sensitivity. Some kids hate automatic doors. Well, you take them to Walmart or some other place that has them that's not busy and let them play with them where they are controlling it. You can find um, soft um, things at thrift shops. There's a paper out called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism. You stimulate two senses at the same time. Use the keywords autism, environmental enrichment. You use those three keywords, you can find that paper. Now, some individuals that can't read will complain that they see the print jiggle on the page. This applies for some dyslexics, too. I don't have this problem. A kid that's got a visual processing problem will often hate escalators, terrify them. They can't tell how to get on and off of escalators. And the eye exam may be normal or almost normal. See, here in the back of the brain, the circuits that assemble the graphics file, nobody knows how they work. Head injuries break it in really weird ways. But a real simple thing you can try is printing the schoolwork on different pastel papers, like light blue, light tan, light green, or light gray paper. Some individuals that are nonverbal complain about images breaking up, similar to a migraine. Imagine if that's what the seeing was like. This is the reason why a lot of nonverbals touch and smell things, because those senses still work. That's why they're using them. Here's an example of what, for some individuals that cannot read, see print jiggling on the page. Now, I want to make it very clear. This doesn't explain all dyslexia. It only explains a subgroup, a subgroup of dyslexia. And the really simple thing is, try some different pastel papers. Now, you might say to me, well, that's not evidence-based, so we can't do it. Well, let me tell you, you're talking about something that's paper. It's colored paper. It's cheap. It takes me 15 minutes to try it, and it's absolutely safe. I'm gonna just go ahead and try it. Now, if something's expensive, possibly dangerous, gonna take me six months of work to try it, then I need the evidence-based. But colored paper, I've seen some careers saved by that. The other big problem is flickering lights. You know, we have LED lighting now. I think these are fluorescents, and for some individuals, they can see flicker, on fluorescent lighting, and they can see flicker on cheap LEDs. And for certain kids, it's gonna drive them crazy in the classroom, because it's gonna be flashing like a strobe light. And, and uh, now we've got all these different kinds of LED lights, ranging from horrible to good. Big Dutchman chicken house lights are really good. And you got, like, the Pilgrim's Pride's got a lot of chickens around here. I saw that yesterday while we were driving over here. Uh, and Big Dutchman uh, poultry house lights absolutely do not flicker. But this could be a really serious problem in an office. Now, some individuals have very severe sensory problems, especially some of the nonverbal individuals. An extreme effort is required to screen out background noise. I have some auditory processing problems. I cannot hear if there's too much background noise. And when the grown-ups talked really fast, it went into gibberish. You gotta slow down when you work with a little kid, slow down. And my speech teacher would enunciate the hard consonant sounds. She'd hold up a cup and she'd go, cup, and then she'd go, cup, ba. She'd switch back and forth between saying it regular, saying it really slow. Also, these kids are like a phone on a really bad connection. Give them time to respond. You got one bar on a phone, it takes time for the website to load you got to give the language program time to load. Always encourage the kid to use his words. And some individuals have problems using two senses at once. They've either got to see something or they've got to hear something. And this is why some of them have problems with eye contact. You know, I think sometimes we have too much emphasis on that. I'm more interested in where they are 10 years after school. You could have lousy eye contact and you could run a really great welding shop or some other business. Environmental Richmond is Effective Treatment for Autism. That's the title of a paper. This is an adjunct to other methods. 
Now, there's been a lot of controversy lately about ABA because you've got people on the autism spectrum, autistic advocates, that hate it because when they were children, they were subjected to some really awful, old-fashioned ABA where they were forced into sensory overload. That was terrible. There's a big difference between that and modern ABA that recognizes sensory issues. But there's still a few people in ABA that are really rigid that don't think sensory problems are real. Sensory problems are real. Like yesterday when I saw this little boy, um, I said, take him down. They had all kinds of experimental play equipment all over this field. And I said, take him down away from where we're at, all the people are at. The next thing I know, he's climbing on this rock, plastic rock thing I had there with another kid. As soon as he got away from the noise. You see, that's a situation where you had to worry of get him out of the sensory overload. And a lot of nonverbals use smell and touch, because those still work. And in this method, you stimulate two senses at the same time with a lot of emphasis on smell and touch. So they might smell aromatherapy and touch some carpet samples or touch a cold water bottle. So you use real simple things and you always change them. Now, if you're working with older adults and older children that are not going to talk, this, these are books you need to read. These are written by people on the spectrum, nonverbal, absolutely certified to type independently. They'll tell you about problems with controlling movement. And I really like, how can I talk if my lips don't move? That's one of my favorites. And then there's the New York Times bestseller, The Reason I Jump. I like the sequel better. The kid's older and has much more insight. But if you're working with uh, not three-year-olds, but when they get up to six or seven years old and they don't talk, these books are must-reads. People on the spectrum telling about their own experiences. Tension shifting slowness, I've got that problem. I have problems with a lot of the back and forth, quick chit chat, social chit chat. I can't hear it, I can't follow it. Now this slide shows very clearly attention shifting slowness. This was done with some of the very earliest eye tracking software, old black and white movie. Look at how many times the normal person looks back and forth compared to the autistic person. That's, that's, that's processor speed. It's sort of like uh, the autistic is the Intel 286, and the normal person is the fanciest Apple computer. Teaching young kids. Slow down when you talk. We already talked about that. Always encourage them to use their words. You might say, do you want milk or juice? Give them a, there's two choices. Get them to use their words. Give them time to respond. Teaching turn taking. There was a lot of emphasis with that with me when I was a little kid. Visual thinking circuits, yep, I got great big visual thinking circuits in my brain. And you can see that these scans are old. This scanner is sitting in your local hospital right now, nobody's using it. You see, this gets into the sort of a turf between, okay, the psychiatrist, verbal-based, the, versus the neurologists. Okay, this uh, right here shows some water right in the middle of working memory. All right, how do we deal with problems like anxiety? I had terrible anxiety. As soon as I hit puberty, horrible anxiety. And I found out that my fear center was three times larger than normal. Just constant state of fear over absolutely nothing. Exercise helped. I made my squeezing machine, deep pressure helped. As I went through my 20s, the fear got worse and I had to go on medication. And if you want to read about that, I'd recommend getting thinking in pictures, because that's where I talk about my own experiences. I don't want any misunderstandings about medication, and that's something I'd rather have you read. But medication saved me. I've been on the same old-fashioned antidepressant for 40 years. Getting hard to get. They just switched suppliers the other day, and I'm going, man, is this new stuff going to work as well as the old version of the drug? Uh, here's things I used to be terrified of. Airplanes and public speaking. I walked out of my first talk. Then I learned to have really good slides. Airplanes, I was in a really, really scary emergency landing as a senior in high school. And that's the plane I was most terrified of. You gotta, when you're in air traffic control, like, they're not always very careful when they talk to the pilots. This thing's called a Fokker. It's the name of this plane. Well, you gotta be really careful how you say that. I was terrified of this plane. 
And when it put the landing gear down, I was sure the whole bottom of the plane was falling out. Now, how did I get over being afraid of airplanes? Had to make them interesting. And I got to ride in the cockpit of this plane hauling dairy heifers. You gotta make stuff you're afraid of interesting. Then you tend to not be afraid of it. Oh yeah, I know everything. I mean, if I go, oh, we just aborted a landing going into Denver. Now we're flying under tower control under the Rockies, 9,500 feet, really low. I'm looking out the window. Pilot's not making an announcement because I know one hand on the yoke and one hand on the throttle. Um, Got to just pay attention to that when you're flying that low. You know, it's a little bit uneasy about that, but I'm going, uh, then he finally does a UE and we go back to the airport. But knowing more about it makes you less afraid. Fear is the main emotion in autism. And low doses of antidepressant medication help me. But the big mistake that's made with drugs like Prozac is too high a dose. Over and over and over again, I've had the parents tell me, did great on a low dose, agitation and insomnia on a higher dose. Just read a paper the other day about those side effects. Come on, you just overdosed them? They oftentimes, all you need is a starter dose or half a starter dose for anxiety. Now, there's way too many drugs given out like candy to little kids. Way too many. I want to try to avoid medication if I can, little kids. Unless they have epilepsy, then you're going to have to treat that. I started taking this as a young adult. But there's been some real messes with drugs. And they just throw prescriptions at things with no thought. Here's a drug horror story that I just heard a month ago. Teenage boy. He's now 100 pounds fat and diabetic from Respiridol. Well, that should have been stopped when he started to gain all that weight. Then they did another drug, Abilify, and wrecked his ability to do algebra. Come on, people, this is totally atrocious. But on the other hand, sometimes you use the right drug just right. I don't think I'd be here today without the medication. And I think the new stuff is working, but I have to say when I got the medication last week, I'm going, whoa, this isn't the same stuff. I think I'm gonna look up the factory that makes it. I always gotta commune with the factory that makes this stuff. Always interested in supply chain management. Now there's a rear view of my squeezing machine. Now deep pressure can really help some people to calm down, but it doesn't work for everybody. And you see that's my skilled trade stuff, I built that. And where did I get the idea of using an air cylinder? I worked in a dairy that had air cylinders to open the gates in the dairy. That's where I got the idea. Now there's a lot of cheaper things you can do like uh, beanbag chairs, weighted vests, things that aren't expensive. Some kids respond to this, some don't. You see, things are variable. You gotta show kids interesting things to get them interested in things. I love the fact that the HBO movie showed all of my projects. And one of them was the optical illusion room. And my science teacher wanted me to figure out how to do it. Tinker and figure out how to do it. Kids are terrified to make mistakes today. And I think some of that's due to the not doing hands-on things. Here's cool math stuff you can find online for your math heads that love patterns. Penrose tiling. That's what Stephen Hawking did all his math in his head. Now here is a good attitude towards disability. Stephen Hawking, you all know who he is. He said, concentrate on those things. Your disability does not prevent you from doing well. He told that to the New York Times shortly before he died. Concentrate on the things that your disability does not prevent you from doing well. Well, trying to teach me algebra was just stupid. Okay, working on my art ability and building things ability, that's something you need to build up. Stephen Hawking could do one thing well and only one thing well, mathematics in his head. Couldn't move you know, near the end of his life, but he could do math in his head and he did it super well. Uh, here's cool, really cool stuff on patterns in nature. Oh, there's all kinds of cool stuff. You wanna show kids cool patterns? Go on to Google Images, type in protein symmetry, protein symmetry. You will see things that look like cathedral windows on the inside your body. Really beautiful. Isn't that cool? Let's get magazines like Science and Nature in the schools. Magazines like Chemical and Engineering News. Yep, then you find out how a power failure in Texas affects play core. They use a plastic powder to um, mold things. That comes from a plant in Texas. And when that got frozen, 
problems. There's a lot of things interconnected in industry. Fractals, another interesting thing. Patterns in nature. And I'm going to leave this slide up here for a while. This is cool educational materials you can get online for free. At the right price, they're free. We have to wrap it up. Well, I'll be out at the book table. I'll be around through lunch. Then we have to go to the airport. I've got to allow plenty of time. There's been storms. Hope that Delta hasn't canceled my flight. And um, thank you all for coming. Thank you.